Okay, so you're living in one of these bloody things, and you might as well, it seems to me, you might as well make it the best one you could live in because you don't have anything better to do. Now, if you don't do that, if you don't do it consciously, and, and this is what the psychoanalysts pointed out, is that you have innumerable quasi-autonomous subsystems that make you up that will generate stories impulsively and you'll just act them out. And you know that because you watch yourself over two weeks and you think, Jesus, I did a lot of stupid things in the last two weeks. And you think, why? And it's because you're a random, you're a collection of somewhat random quasi-autonomous personality units and lacking a leader, they're just going to fire off whenever they want, you know. First you're hungry, then you're thirsty, then you want to go to bed with your wife, you know. Then you want to sleep in, then you want to tell your boss off, then you want to curse at the guy that cuts you off in traffic. It's like, you're kind of like a two-year-old, you know, just it's one emotional frame after another vying for dominance. There's no overarching hierarchy and there's no king at the top. And so, you know, we already talked about pyramids of competence and what's supposed to be at the top is you want to bring all those things together. We understand this neurologically. I'll show you some of that in a little bit. We understand this neurologically, how, 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 how this maps in some sense right onto the neural structure of your being. You want to put something in control and the thing that you should put in control is the bloody thing that pays attention and learns, right? Everything else in the hierarchy should be subordinate to the thing that pays attention and learns. And you could think, well, that's, that's the message of the idea of logos. That's for sure, because logos is partly attention and partly communication. And you learn a lot by communicating with others. Okay, so you need to know where you are. Just like your GPS, which is about the closest thing we have to an intelligent cybernetic system. Those GPSs in your cars, those bloody things are pretty smart because they can... They know where you are, they know where you're going, and if you go off course, they recalculate your route. It's like those things are damn near alive. That's so close to intelligence. It's, and you, you can tell that because they act intelligently. They solve problems continually. So you need, and this is a cybernetic model, by the way, and cybernetic models were the models on which the GPS systems were based. So it's not accidental. So you need to know where you are and you need to know where you're going. And then the next thing you need to know is how it is that you're going to act move your body, how you're going to propel yourself through time and space to transform this into that. And so, okay, and then we can, we can make that a little bit more complex because it's a bit too simple. So we'll do this. So it isn't exactly that you live in one of these. It's that you live in a nested hierarchy of these. And you could think of this as your own internal patriarchy. That's a good way of thinking about it. And maybe it could be a tyrant or maybe it could be something that gives you security and functional autonomy, and hopefully that's the one you go for. But it's a battle, you know, because a little bit of tyranny exists in everyone. And so, well, so at the very highest level of analysis, so that would be the overarching story, maybe you think, I'd like to be a good person, or a successful person, or a famous person. I think good's probably be better, because you can come up with the definition of good if you want, as long as it doesn't annoy other people too badly because they'll just get in your way, and that won't be helpful. So you have to negotiate it. But let's say you're a good person. That's sort of the story at the top of the hierarchy, and then you could de decompose that into your primary roles. Maybe you're a good parent, maybe you're a good employer, or maybe you're a good employee, maybe you're a good sibling, maybe you're a good child. You know, those are major roles that you have in your life. And so you'd say that what good person is is what's good about you across all those roles. So it's a, it's, a, it's a higher order abstraction from something more concrete. And then you can take the, you know, the, the role good parent and you can say, well, what is it that constitutes a good parent? And you might say, well, a good parent, this isn't exhaustive, obviously. A good parent has a good job and, and takes care of his or her family. And then you might say, well, what does it mean to take care of your family? And then you might say, well, you know, you, you can cook the odd meal, not too odd, hopefully. You can cook the odd meal, and you can play with, play with the baby. And then you might say, well, how do you play with a baby? And then you might say, well, you play peekaboo with the baby, or you tickle the baby. Okay, well, that, what's a cool? There's a cool shift there, because this is all articulated and conceptual, right? Right down to this level, and then all of a sudden, it's your body. Because how do you play peekaboo with a baby? 
you don't like have a chat about how you play peekaboo with a baby, right? You, you go like this. It's quite fun. You can even do it with older people. They even smile about it, right? It's Dad's gone and the baby's all shocked to death about that. Where'd he go? Oh, look, he's back. You know, it's the baby is playing with the reliability of the world. So it's a real intense game for a baby. It's like, <laughs> it's like, oh no, dad's gone. Oh look, he showed up again. Oh no, he's gone. And then dad's smiling to indicate that those brief flashes into non-existence aren't existentially terrifying beyond <laughs> capacity, right? And so but the point is, is that if you're playing peekaboo with a baby, you're not thinking anymore. It's not in the realm of articulation or abstraction. It's actually something that you're doing with your body. And so to me, this is a nice multi-stage solution to the mind-body problem. Because what happens is that the, highest, the higher order of abstraction, it's articulated and conceptual. But if you decompose it sufficiently, you end up with an actual action. And the action involves the movement of musculature. It's not something conceptual. And one of the things that's really cool about this hierarchy is that it has educational lessons. So one of the things you want to do if you're trying to teach someone something, even yourself, is you want to, you want to specify the thing that needs to be doing at the highest resolution possible level. So I'll give you just a brief example. So let's say, I, I may, have re, may be repeating this, but it doesn't matter. Say you've got a three-year-old kid and they're in, their room is chaos, right? There's monsters are gonna be coming out under the bed in no time flat, unless that thing, room gets some order in it. And so you, you tell the kid, clean up the room. You know, it's a mess. And you leave and you come back and the kid's like throwing Legos everywhere. It's, they're not cleaning up. And then you think, that's a bad kid. Well, that's a bad theory, eh? Because you're going right from here to here. And if you want to have a good fight with someone and destroy them, then that's what you do. You don't bother with the subtleties down here. You just go right, from the, right for the jugular. It's like you're a bad, stupid kid. You've always been that way. You're hopeless. There's not a chance of teaching you anything, right? And we can, that way you can nail the past, the present, and the future all in the same insult. You've always been a terrible person. You're, there's no teaching you, and your future is going to be exactly the same way. And then the only thing the person can do if you do that to them is hit you, because that's, that's it. There's no, there's no coming back from that. You've boxed them completely in. So if you want to have a really unproductive argument, you go right for this. Past, present, and future, you're not a good person. Demolish their entire conceptual structure and expose them completely naked to chaos. It's like, great, you won the argument. It's not a good thing to do to your long-term partner, let's say, unless you want them terrified out of their skull and uh, characterized, and their attitude towards you characterized by non-stop extreme resentment. It's probably not going to do your love life a hell of a lot of good, for example. So with the three-year-old, maybe what you do is you say, you, you, you pick the level of analysis at which they're actually functioning, and you say, and this is something you can do if you pay attention to a kid, and lots of people won't pay attention to children because they're terrified of them. They're terrified that they'll do something wrong with them and, or that, that the kid won't like them or some damn thing. It's like all you have to do to get a kid to like you is pay attention to the kid for like two seconds and the kid will instantly like you because attention is so, it's such a, it's, it's the ultimate currency for children, right? They, they, they need adult attention because adults know way more than kids and so they love attention. All you have to do is pay attention to them and they will like you instantly. So you tell the kid, you see that teddy bear? The kid goes, yes. Then you've established that the child has mastered the art of perceiving a teddy bear. Because they can say, yes, it's, it's a complicated thing, man. It's like a six-month-old isn't going to do that. Three-month-old has got the whole teddy bear identification subroutine automatized. So teddy bear, yes. Can you pick it up? Yes. Pat, pat, pat. Good work. Do you see the hole on that shelf? Yes. Can you put the teddy bear in that hole? Yes. Go over and do that. Pat, pat, pat. Great. OK, now we'll do thing number two, thing number three. So you're building up the micro routines of cleaning up the room from the bottom up, right? You're, you're building it into their body, because you're starting with the things they've already automatized and building upwards towards abstraction. And so once the kid has all the micro routines down, and maybe there's, a, I don't know, how many micro routines are there to clean up your room? 200? Like, a lot, but not an infinite number. So you teach them all the micro-routines, and then you can say, run set of micro-routines, which means clean up room. And then they can do it. They know what it means. 
so, but you do the building from the bottom up. And lots of times when you're arguing with someone that you live with and hypothetically love, although those two things are hard to get together in the same relationship, um, what you want to do is assume, is assume stupidity before you assume total, in, total malevolence. That's, that's, that's a good rule of thumb for establishing peace. So maybe if your partner won't do something, well, maybe it's, there's something going on up here, but you might want to assume to begin with that they actually just don't know how to do it and you need to decompose it. So maybe there's a way you want to be greeted when you come home because you're going to come home every day probably and maybe that's a five-minute interaction or a 10-minute interaction. So that's an hour a week or four hours a month or 50 hours a year or one solid work week of coming home interactions, right? All you have to do is get 50 interactions like that right and you've got your relationship sorted out. That's something that's really worth thinking about because that's it. There's, you just don't have that much time, right? Get the meals sorted out. That's about five hours a day. Get your sleeping time arrangements sorted out. Get the fundamental interactions that you repeat with your partner uh, worked out voluntarily and negotiated. You're going to cover 80% of your life that way, and then it can just run as a routine. And that's really helpful. And if you don't do that consciously, especially because our roles have fragmented and most of the traditional roles have disappeared, and so nobody knows who the hell is supposed to do what in the kitchen, for example. So nobody does anything except bitch and fight and make wretched meals or, or, buy, or buy fast food or some, something like that. So, you know, the, the alternative to that catastrophic failure or continual resentment and fighting is to rebuild the structures from the bottom up using consensus and negotiation.